Good morning. Good morning. I welcome all of you to our worship here at First Church. And uh, we have a couple of announcements. First of all, we have a Bible study on Tuesdays at 10 o'clock. We are studying Gospel of John. Please come and join us. United Methodist Men's Breakfast uh, will be held this coming Sunday at 7.30 and uh, all men are invited to come and join us, the Christian fellowship with uh, one another. And now we have an uh, announcement from our sister, Ellen Jones, uh, followed by Suji Hirschberg. Good morning. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 through 7, we read, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. During our recent Staff Parish Relations Committee meeting, many concerns and praises were presented and addressed. After lengthy discussion and careful consideration, the consensus of those in attendance was that we should request of our District Superintendent, Dana White, that Pastor Kong continue to provide pastoral leadership for both First and Zion United Methodist Churches. As your SPRC, we are asking two things of each member in this congregation. First, continue to express your praises and your concerns for members of our staff. Your voice is important and we will listen. Members of the SPRC, representing this congregation are Doris Anderson, David Dutton, Randy Eford, Susie Hirschberger, Jody Kaiser, Kay Martin, Earl Poplin, Sarah Price, Chuck Ruth, and myself. Zion's representative is Kevin Haycock. Second, we ask that grace be shown to each other inside these walls as well as beyond these walls and into our community as we worship and go forth to serve. And finally, let me share the words of one of my favorite hymns entitled, Grace Alone. Every promise we can make, every prayer and step of faith, every difference we can make is only by his grace. Every mountain we will climb, every ray of hope we shine, every blessing left behind is only by his grace. Every soul we long to reach, every heart we hope to teach, everywhere we share his peace is only by his grace. Every loving word we say, every tear we wipe away, every sorrow turned to praise is only by his grace. Grace alone, which God supplies, strength unknown he will provide, Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. I just have a few thoughts I want to share with you this morning regarding the recent work of the SPRC. I promise to be brief. First, it's my deeply held belief that the process the United Methodist Church uses to assign pastors to congregations is God-driven. Romans 13.1 tells us that God concerns himself with establishing leaders even in earthly governments. Certainly, if God concerns himself with establishing worldly leaders, he must be intimately involved in choosing leaders for his church especially when his work is carried out by the godly men and women in the district to whom he has given this authority. The decision we make about leadership for our congregation each year starts from this 
foundation. Second, in the decades I have attended church, I have had pastors who were what I would call pastors of my heart, pastors who preached sermons that spoke directly to me, who I could talk to and confide in, and under whose leadership I thrived spiritually. But not every pastor I have had has been this kind of pastor for me. The simple truth is that situations where a pastor fits every member of a congregation are rare. So one time, I will be the one who thrives under a particular pastor, and the next time, it will be you. It's important that all of us recognize that there are those in our fellowship whose needs are being met. As part of a community, and particularly as members of the body of Christ, each of us will at times be called upon to set aside our personal wants and desires for the sake of others in our fellowship. Romans 12, 9 and 10 puts it this way, let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. When we put the needs of others ahead of our own, we are living out the instruction to outdo one another in showing honor. The SPRC prayerfully considered all the input we received. Whatever your perspective, you were heard. Thank you for trusting us to make this important decision about leadership for First and Zion churches for the coming year and for your faith that God works through all things for the good of those who love him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we sometimes fall short of your desire for us, but at our best, we seek your guidance and place our trust in you. At our best, we listen to each other and consider one another's needs. At our best, we consider the good of our fellowship when we make decisions. At our best, we consider the needs of our brothers and sisters at Zion. At our best, we believe you can work through imperfect processes and use imperfect people. At our best, you give us the grace needed to put the good of others before our own personal good. We beseech you, Father, help us always to be at our best. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, uh, Ellen and Susie and all SPRC members and all of you. Uh, I will do my best to serve God and love God and love you and serve you at this church. Uh, is there any announcement? Let us prepare our hearts and the mind for worship.
stand for a call to worship. Gather with the crowds who seek to touch Jesus. Come to hear and be healed. We are poor and hungry, and we need our souls are so Cursed are those who put their trust in human beings and make a flesh their arm. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Our faith is not in vain, and our hope is sure. We rejoice and live for joy at the good news. Our opening hymn is Majesty, Worship His Majesty, that is found on page 176. We are going to sing twice. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious power, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of our sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
in the prayer of confession. O oh God, our hearts are deceitful, and our ears are turned to the counsel of this world. Our lips join the course of scoffers, and our deeds betray the impurity of our motives. We seek personal gain more than the reign of your love, and individual fulfillment more than the building of community. Heal us, O oh God, of the diseases that distort our perception and trouble our spirits. Free us to drink the pure water you provide. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now our assurance of forgiveness. By the power of God, Jesus reached out to heal the afflicted and cleanse the troubled spirit. When we want that transformation within and among us, more than we want to cling to the past, we will know the blessing of forgiveness. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and offers to lift us up from the death of sin. Claim the victory over sin that comes to those who hope in Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now join me in my prayer for illumination. Holy God, word made flesh, let us come to this word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas. Banish our assumptions. Cast our casual detachment. Confound our expectations. Clear the cobwebs from our ears. Penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can. We pray that you will. And we wait with great anticipation. Amen. Today's scripture comes from the Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is the word of God for you, the people of God.
to do the children's sermon. And so I dressed appropriately. Does anyone know what tomorrow is? Ooh, it's a great holiday. Everybody can, can participate. And um, Pastor Mike, I would like to know, let you know, I was working on this before I heard your um, message on Wednesday. But, so there are some similarities. But there are, um, first with, uh, what, who is St. Valentine? Valentine's Day is for St. Valentine's. Could have been more than one person. They said one was a Roman priest in the third century, and he performed weddings that were illegal at the time because the Romans wanted soldiers not to have wives. It made them better warriors. The bishop of Turin, Turney was jailed helping Christians escape, and he sent a signed note to his girlfriend or the jailer's daughter, they're not sure, and it said, from your valentine. Then, both were killed. So they were martyrs, and that's why they were made saints. And I looked at the history of Valentine's Day, and in tra the traditions, February the 14th was in honor of the death of those two martyrs. And also, like a lot of things, it fell in line with a pagan holiday that was celebrated at the same time that was a, a fertility celebration. First cards were actually sent in the 1400s, mostly, of course, handwritten until the 1900s when they started making printed cards, and then things just exploded. And today, the estimate is 145 million Valentines are sent every February the 14th. Then, this is for Pastor Mike. Chocolate was considered romantic as far back as 500 BC. He didn't know about the chocolate tradition. They gave hot chocolate to the bride and groom at weddings in ancient marriage rituals, sometimes with the Aztecs, but they found it in several different uh, records that they were used, used chocolate in marriage rituals, hot chocolate. In the 1860s, Cadbury decided to make chocolate hearts. Now 58 million pounds of chocolate are sold every year for Valentine's. Red hearts that we use, like these, are 17th century. They think it was Saint Margaret Mary who envisioned a red heart surrounded by thrones. And sometimes we see that and it's the sacred heart of Jesus. The real message we can see at Valentine's Day, even for children, is that Valentine's cards and gifts are expressions of our love. The Bible says true love is unselfish and directed at others. A love that is eternal, true love does not exist without God. Through our love, the world can know God's love. So let's all use Valentine's Day as a time to show others God's love. In John 15, he says, love one another as I have loved you. So tomorrow, you should call a friend, text a friend, uh, send a message to people that do those kinds of, you know, use their phones for messages and wish them a happy Valentine's Day. Somebody you see at the grocery store. Or go get some flowers at the local florist tomorrow, who I think <laughs> hours are until they need to close. I'm shaking my head too much. I lost my Valentine's. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do. And as children, and by the time my children were small, they gave cards to everyone in the class. Pastor Mike said sometimes he was left out. Normally that doesn't happen anymore. Or it's not supposed to. You're not even supposed to address them to a certain person. You just fill out so many cards and put your name on the inside. That way you can't hand pick one to give to somebody that you think is like the smelly kid or whatever. So with that in mind, I'd like to close with a little prayer. Lord, fill our hearts and bless our souls for the gift of love. Give us sincere and generous love to touch each other every day. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, I like chocolate. I just want you to know. Uh, put that out there. Um, I should be letting it alone. 
but that's one of my vices. I like chocolate. And I hope you all will enjoy uh, Valentine's Day tomorrow and showing your love to one another. And you may even join the Super Bowl tonight. <laughs> I, I just wonder who has the best spread, you know, the, the, with the chicken wings. And, and if there's anybody out there, I just want to know uh, who produces the most goodies on uh, uh, for uh, a uh, Super Bowl party. But I'm glad to be with you today. Several weeks ago, uh, Pastor Kong was talking about forgiveness in his sermon, and it stuck in my head, and that's where I went to today. To want to share with you. Uh, the scripture is, was read earlier, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. <clears throat> now, God asks us frequently in life to do things that are difficult. He says, go beyond what the world teaches you about relationships, because I'm asking you, if anybody harms you, Know that God has forgiven you, and it's your responsibility to forgive someone else. We're called to exceed the standards that are set and expectations by our regular earthly standards. Christianity is hard. Sometimes it's very difficult to forgive people. Uh, Christianity is not for wimps or lazy people. It's for those who are strong and who are willing to live according to what God has established for us. And we start with the fact that God forgives us. No matter what we've done, how many times we've done it, uh, no matter where we were, if we've fallen short. And all of us have fallen short. And we continue to fall short, but God never stops offering us his forgiveness. Enables us to move forward, to move on in life. And so we're asked to offer the same. Um, we're asked to truly recognize our mistakes and repent. Well, I had a friend in seminary many years ago who was happily married, had a wife and two children, and they we're going to take a break. And so they went to the Outer Banks for uh, vacation. And if you go to the Outer Banks, you go over there for Highway 64 and go across that long bridge as you go out to the Outer Banks. Their uh, time at the beach was over, and so they were headed back. And there on that bridge, unbeknownst to them, here came another driver, intoxicated, ran into them head on. They're all taken to the hospital. And the wife and the two children passed away. Could you imagine? The preacher was devastated, angry, upset, hurt. I understand that. He wasn't sure that he even wanted to live himself after losing his wife and his children. He said, I'm not sure I can go back and preach in the pulpit. I'm angry at God for letting it happen. He was full of anger and bitterness and hatred, which I understand. It took him a long time to work on that. About two years later, I was with him in a, a group. And we all wanted to say something and ask him how he was doing, but none of us had the nerve to do it uh, because... We didn't know how to handle it either. We didn't know how to handle his difficulties. But he said, I know that you all are uncomfortable. I'm just going to tell you something. He said, uh, I was really struggling for a long time. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to move forward in life to do my responsibilities. God kept working on me and said, I learned that the only way forward is to forgive the pain he's, this other person caused me. I had to let it go. Otherwise, it was eating on me, tearing me up, making me uh, a very weak person. You know how I did that? I, I don't know I could have done that. The uh, person had been prosecuted by then and receiving some prison time, 
for homicide by vehicle. But the preacher went to see him in the prison and said, I have to forgive you because I can't go forward a day until I put this behind me and forgive you. I know you didn't intend to do it. So he offered him forgiveness. They prayed together. The person that had caused the accident was so overwhelmed by that, he changed his life and gave his life to God. And if you didn't even a step further, they developed a relationship. And they, to this day, will go and teach seminars to uh, teenagers and other people about drinking and driving and about recuperating from the pain that it causes. Now that took a lot of guts. That took a lot of power. That took a lot of energy on the part of him to want to move forward in life and to forgive. You know, all of us have something in life. Someone in life that has harmed us in some way. It may be some little thing, it may be some big thing. But what our tendency is to do is to, somebody who harms us, we want to get them back. We want retribution. We want them punished. I see some people shaking their head. Yeah. We want them to get and call and get the pain caused to them that they've caused to us. That is our natural way of doing things. But what does that accomplish when the day is over? Nothing. Other than we are stepping outside of the bounds of what God wants us to do. When we try to cast retribution. And then we hold grudges against people that have harmed us. I had a person in one of my churches say, don't you ever make me angry. I said, well, I don't intend to. <laughs> uh, he said, because if you make me angry, I'll hold a grudge forever, and I'll do whatever I can to get back at you. That's a great way to start a relationship, to win friends and influence uh, people. Uh, I said, I will try my best not to make you angry. I'm not going to tell you the rest of that story. But anyway, uh, that's how it, we started out when I went to that church. We want punishment. We want retribution. We want to hold people accountable. Uh, we believe that's the way to change. God says, no, you've got to offer forgiveness. That's the beginning of changing people's lives. We want to offer forgiveness so that they can become whole persons in Jesus Christ. Uh, we are uh, a nation that incarcerates more human beings than any other nation, uh, non-violent. Now, I understand there are people who need to be separated. I get that. But there are so many people who uh, have drug violations or some other violation that are incarcerated for long periods of time and uh, not behavior is not corrected. What we should be about in the church, what we're about is offering love, reconciliation, and Alternative, teach to do better, to do differently. Um, I always remember when I was at Methodist University as a dean of students, I was in charge of discipline. That was not a good one to give to me, but anyway, I had it. Um, and I was always trying to not punish students, but correct their behavior. So I'd give uh, sanctions where they would learn or try to learn from that behavior. And a lot of people gave me a hard time, said, get rid of them, expel them. Send them away. I say, what good does that do? But just uh, get it away from you. That doesn't help them. And if they're going to be in college, they need to learn to do differently. Um, so it's not about retribution. It's about forgiveness and love and redemption. Oh, so important. Uh, we need to get rid of the bitterness that we have caused. You know, verse 31, right before uh, uh, the verse I read to you, as our scripture, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of behavior. You know, there are persons that don't have much power, so a way to get back at you, if you offended someone, they're going to tell stories on you. And if there's nothing to tell, they're going to make it up. We've had that happen over and over again. People will make up things to tell, and then before you know it, if you tell enough, somebody will, will, will believe it. 
Put that behind you. Let it go so that you can move forward. Um, why do we do that? Well, forgiveness gives us a new insight in life. It's to redeem ourselves in God's eyes. God tells us we need to forgive just as Christ forgave us. Why should we receive forgiveness and not give that to somebody else? It provides healing for ourselves and others. You know that minister friend of mine said if he had not done that, if he had not forgiven him, he could not do his job and uh, could not move forward. Forgiveness enables us to change our way of life. To change what we've been doing that's holding us back. It's a way of experiencing joy. My friend, for a long time, said there's no more joy in his life. He has joy now. He said because I forgave and was able to move forward, that I was able to learn from this experience and I can share my learnings with other people. And that gives me joy. And we can move forward in grace. God's grace sees us through. You know, we're never guaranteed anything in life that says to us, uh, because of who you are and because you're faithful, nothing bad is going to happen. No one's going to offend you. You're not going to offend anybody else. No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, we are to do everything we can to offer that forgiveness. Well, now, there's a part two here. Forgiving others is easy compared to what I'm going to say now. So get ready. The great and most difficult thing in life is not forgiving others, it's forgiving yourself. You think about that. So many of us are stuck because we've never let go of some past thing or event that we were responsible for that dictates and controls our life. Let it go. You can't do anything about it. It's done. But you can learn from it and move forward. But you've got to forgive yourself. Sometimes you can't forgive others because you never forgave yourself. Now there, you know, I've worked with young people most of my life, and uh, some of them say, um, I have no regrets. I've never done anything wrong. Man, I don't believe that. Uh, they just they, they, they don't know it yet, but they, they learn a little bit later uh, as they get older and say, oh, I wish I'd done that differently, so I told you. All of us have something we think we'd have been better if we'd done it a different way. We, we'd, uh, we'd be a better human being if we could let go of some of our mistakes. Our mistakes do not define who we are now. Who we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Five minutes ago. Uh, doesn't matter. Because with God, we can move forward becoming better human beings. What does that do for us if we forgive ourselves? Well, it enables us to redeem ourselves in God's eyes. It's able, it enables us to heal ourselves from being stupid in the past. Someone says to me, I hear this quote now, you can't fix stupid. Well, I'm going to tell you, and with God, you can. You can fix things in the past. You said, golly, that was a stupid thing to do. That's all right. You learn that. We know that. We're going to move forward. We can change life for the better. We can experience joy after letting go of that pain. And we can move forward in grace. I've met several people in my life that say, I'm not worthy of going to church. I said, what do you mean? They said, because I, I, I'm a bad person. I've done this, this, that, and other. I said, that's precisely where you should be. And I'll tell you what, you've got a lot of company if you come to church because we all have fallen short of God's glory and are not acting as who we should be. So we can all be sinners together and we can learn together and move forward. That's one of the things, great things about the church. It's not a place for all saints, all the people who've never made a mistake. It's for us who have made mistakes, recognize that, and we come together to learn how to be better and to move forward with God's grace. That's a powerful statement. Not many things uh, 
do I know that we gather for in life, that we gather because we need to learn how to do better because of our past. Let it go. Whatever it is that's holding you back, whatever you, you feel like you've done that uh, has made you fail and make you not worthy, you are worthy. You are a worthy child of God. I don't care what you've done. God doesn't have limitations on his forgiveness. Jesus doesn't have limitations. He reached out to everyone, loved them no matter what, and moved on. It's up to us to do the same. Well, we're called to accept each other, forgive each other, and move forward in grace. I want you to do something as I'm pulling this together. I want you to just close your eyes and bow your head. I want you to think of someone in your life that you need to forgive right now. It may be a family member. It may be a neighbor. It may be a friend. It may be a stranger. Just think of someone. And say to yourself in your mind right now, I forgive you. I love you as God loves you. And we want to move forward. I do not wish you any harm. I do not wish you any ill will. I wish you redemption in God's eyes. Now, while your heads are bowed and eyes closed, here it comes, the hardest part. I want you to forgive yourself. Think about something in your past that may be holding you back. Something you did young when you're young in life or something you did later on, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm not asking for true confession. I'm just asking you to say, let it go. Say, God, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. You still love me. And I'm ready to move forward. Enable me to just forget it and to let it go so that I can be the person you've called me to be. I want to move forward. And it's by your grace and love, that I can. Whatever it is, it's not too big, it's not too small. Let it go from this day forward. And remember these words. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. In the name of God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Sefley. Now let us offer ourselves and uh, our offerings to God. Sorry about that.
pray. May these gifts of a response to your love enable many to touch Jesus and be healed. May your church manage well the resources entrusted to us that faith and hope may abound. We rejoice in the resurrection and its power to transform us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue to worship our living and loving God, first of all, we give thanks to God for our uh, guest speaker today, Reverend Dr. Mike Safely. What a powerful sermon that he preached. And also, uh, we gi I give thanks to God for all SPRC members and all of you and your acceptance uh, of me and the ministry uh, that I uh, have been doing at this church. And I promise I will do my best uh, to uh, build up the body of Christ. And we give thanks to God. Some of you have had traveled uh, and came back, especially uh, Brother Bruce and Chief. Uh, we need to really give them encouragement because they got gold medals in the tournament. So let us give them a big hand. <laughs> gold medals. We are very proud of you. And also, we lift up uh, Greg aside for his surgery on Tuesday. Remember him in your prayers. Some men of the church will replace Martha Ross's ramp on tomorrow on Tuesday. Uh, if you are interested to help uh, Mar uh, Marsha, please uh, contact Brother Jim uh, for more information. Continue to remember Brother Jimmy Robinson and Jean Side, and also remember Lisa La Rosa, who passed away, and remember the family in your prayers. We are grateful uh, to, uh, to see our sister Lillian Stark, who has been uh, out of church for a while, and now she is present. We are uh, very grateful for your presence. Remember Buzz Dunlap and Monica Marie, and also nursing home uh, residents and the homebound people, Sarah Jordan, Barry Ingram, and Marietta Andrews, Marsha Russell, and Peggy Haywood. Continue to remember Brother Grant Andrews and Jimmy Blanchard, and uh, Gloria Bowles, and Janet Ifford, Sarah Honeycutt, Andrew Milholland, and uh, Tri uh, Trish uh, Harris, and uh, uh, remember other people in your prayers. Is there anyone who uh, wants to share a prayer concern or a celebration? Suji. Yes, I just want to um, rejoice that Pastor Kong, who I know as a man of God, uh, a man with a deep prayer life, I want to rejoice that he will be our leader. Thank you. Anyone else? I just let you know I'm here for God and for you. And you have been in my prayers every single day in my prayers. I promise on that. When you are down and out, call me. I'll be right there for you. Let's pray. Oh Lord, as we reflect on the past seven days, each of us has something for which we can give thanks. Thank you for the touch of a family and a friend, a new insight, the chance to share what you have with others, a beautiful sunset, that filled our hearts. Whatever it was that gave us joy, we give thanks. We thank you for the great joy that is ours in Jesus Christ, your Son, 
who was sent to bring good news about life and your love. He has shown us the way of salvation and the life abundant. Yet, how little we thought about him this week draw us closer to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, shape us more into Christ's image, an image of love, compassion, forgiveness and mercy, truth and justice, faithfulness and holiness. We give you thanks for his model for our lives and ask courage to seek after him. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and glory forever. Amen. Reverend safely talked about forgiveness. So our closing hymn is help us to accept each other. We are going to sing in the tune of Church's One Foundation. So please stand and join me, hymn number 560, in the tune of 545.
Help us to do as you have commanded. As you have forgiven us, allow us to forgive ourselves and others. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his counsel upon you and give you peace. Amen.